Welcome back to Trendlines Over Headlines, the show where we break down the markets with some of the best traders and analysts in the world. My name is Patrick Dunawilla. I'm the editor of The Chart Report, and I'll be your host. We're sitting at that sweet spot in the calendar year where seasonality starts to turn bullish again. So we invited Jeff Hirsch back onto the show to give us an update on seasonality. Now, Jeff is the editor of the Stock Traders Almanac and the expert when it comes to stock market seasonality. So I can't think of a better time of year to be talking to him. You won't want to miss it. But before we talk to Jeff, it's Friday. The markets are closed. So let's take a quick look at how this week played out. The major indices closed slightly higher this week, with the exception of the Russell 2000, which fell more than 1.5%. The Dow led, gaining a little less than 1%, while the NASDAQ was pretty much flat on the week. Let's take a closer look at the S&P 500. It pulled back a little these last two days, but still ended higher on the week by about a half a percent. We're continuing to hold above support at 4,300, which we reclaimed last Friday on that reversal. We drilled into that gap from September this week, but couldn't quite fill it. Now, a close above 4,400 would fill that gap, so that'll be at the top of the bull's to-do list next week. Taking a quick look at the sectors of the S&P 500, nine of the 11 sectors closed higher this week. Energy led by a decent margin, gaining about 4.5%. Materials and consumer discretionary were the only two that closed lower. Discretionary was the weakest, falling about 1%. Anyway, that's enough from me. Let's see what Jeff has to say about these markets. All right, Jeff, welcome back to the show. It's good to see you, and thanks for coming on. Good to see you. How's everything with you? It's it's going well, but you know, I'm, I'm glad to have you on specifically right now because it's that time of year again, right? It's the it's the time of year where you want to buy in October and, and you finish it up for us. And get your portfolio sober. <laughs> and yes. by the way, I, 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 misquoted, I yeah. misquoted in the chart report the other day. I used that quote, buy, your, buy in October and get yourself sober. And I misattributed it to your father, but you just corrected me and said, that's actually your quote. Is that right? If, if, if someone mistakes it for being the wisdom of my, my late father, that, that's, that's fine by me. <laughs> as long as it said Hirsch after it. Yeah, right. There you go. Uh, so okay. you, you were on the show around this time last year. And by the way, today we're recording this on Thursday. Uh, mm -hmm. Today marks the one year anniversary of the bear market low um, or, you know, we'll, we'll hope that's the low. Right? Uh, right. But when you were on the show, I think we had you on the last day of September, right before October, uh, just a couple weeks before the bottom, you had pointed out that October, um, a lot of bear markets tend to bottom in October. It sits at a very um, important location in the calendar ahead of the best three months of the year, November, December, January. You've got the you know, October 31st uh, distribution deadline for funds. Um, you've got you know, end of Q3, beginning Q4, portfolio restructuring, window dressing, tax loss selling, um, you know, for that, uh, for, for the funds in their quarter, quarter end. Uh, and it just sits at this spot of, of like, it's almost like a, uh, where two rivers collide. It's like a confluence where you have a lot of action going on, people setting up for the big investment flows that come in towards the end of the year. And, you know, you've, you've got the end, like the, Fourth quarter is a whole different animal. It's like the the setup for the new year, you know. Whereas there's a lot of quarterly impacts from, um, um, you know, the funds where they where the flows going in and out and they're reporting. But then you get into the Q3, which has its own th the end of Q3 has its own thing, and then Q4 is like the the setup for the beginning of the excuse me the next year. So that's what creates the seasonality. Everyone starts planning for the next year. I mean. You're starting to look for your summer house uh, already. You know, you got to get that uh, booked up for next summer. You got to see what your plans are for, you know, the, the holidays. And, you know, everyone's already talking about, I mean, there's already like Christmas lights up somewhere. Uh, you know, it's it's just 
it sits at that spot in the calendar where things change and, and, the, and the market and the economy and everyone's psyche turns. And this whole year has been tracking the seasonal cycle really, really well. Uh, can you remember a year in your career where seasonality tracked uh, better than it is now? Or no, does this surprise no, it's, you? It's, it's hard. It, 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 it concerns me. And not just this year, but the last three, like the whole four year cycle. You know, I, I just I get concerned. You know, we always joke about, you know, when you see those stats that, oh, something is, is up, you know, 18 and oh times or, you know, and down none when this happens. It, it's just a record that's waiting to be broken. But, you know, uh, there's hubris that you got to be careful of. You know, the old walking on water indicator we used to hang on on my father's office for a joke. But I have not seen or can't remember uh, um, not just one year, but three years, you know, or two and a half, two and three quarters that have tracked the seasonal patterns of the four-year cycle as closely. Um, I only can can use what I'm looking at, the tools I have, the the, the pattern, the momentum, the fundamentals, the technicals, everything we look at to project that it, uh, it should continue until it, it's like us, like Newton's law. It's like something in motion until it's, you know, knocked off is going to keep going that way. But I am concerned that that something could knock it off. And, you know, you always have to be. But right now uh, I'm seeing a fourth quarter rally. Uh, all this uh, uh, volatility and 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 some of the the geopolitical stuff is very um, very October ish. You know, it's it's yeah. October phobia. Uh, I'm not happy about what's going on in the world. It's disturbing, upsetting. But you know, 50 years ago, the same thing happened in October in uh, the Middle East. Um, the market seems to be handling it, it well, but today we're seeing some some uh, uh some impact in the market i'm not sure it's it's related to geopolitical events just yet but um we'll find out you know it's october yeah so i'm gl you you answered one of my questions which was uh you know does it make you nervous when you see seasonality tracking so well and you also made a great point it's not just this year it's really been the last three years you know uh midterm years like 2022 yeah. was tend to be the worst of the four-year cycle. And sure enough, so far, that was a pretty, pretty bad year. I mean, worse since 08. Um, so what, and, and then the pre-election year, 2023, tends to be the best, right? And Correct. that we're also seeing that strength play out. So why don't you tell the folks at home what to expect from seasonality in the remainder of October and the remainder of the year? Well, I mean, as you were, you were talking, I rolled up to one of my charts, the four-year cycle chart, um, you know, which I just updated. Uh, I think it's yesterday's close I have in there. And, you know, you can see the four-year cycle tracking so closely here. Uh, I don't know if I, if I get a little laser pointer uh, here. You can see, you know, the solid lines of the current cycle. You know, this is uh, 21, 22, and 23. The dotted lines are um, the history back to 49 for uh, Dow and S&P um, and then NASDAQ in the um, the blue is is uh, back to 71 when NASDAQ started. But, you know, when we were talking at, at the beginning of uh, at the end of September last year, I was talking about the sweet spot of the four year cycle, the um, right. midterm year Q4 to uh, um, Q2 pre-election year. Um, which just, you know, we hit it. Yeah, we had that, that, that uh, lower low uh, for NASDAQ at the end of 22, but it made up for it. We got those sweet spot gains, which were, you know, about 20% on average for Dow and S&P and, and close to 30 on NASDAQ. We, we pretty much got those. And, um, what you see here, I mean, I can, I can zoom in a little bit, uh, uh on the pre-election year in a second, but just on the, the full four year cycle, you see, you know, this sideways action in, you know, Q3 of the pre-election year, which, you know, you mentioned pre-election year, the best year of the four-year cycle. However, there's still this week period, this week seasonal period, and it was quite pronounced this year. Um, and this, this you know, mid-July peak, which is, is what has been happening a lot lately. And then you see a rally right. towards year end. Most of the highs are, are the biggest cluster of new highs in pre-election years, December, and a lot of them on the last trading day. And then, you know, 
looking out to next year, probably run up to a new high um, in the first quarter uh, and then sideways again. And then, you know, a, a bit of a, a, a push higher towards the end of the year. There's a lot of other things that will happen there. We can talk about the power of a sitting president. But I think I want to show you, I'm going to scroll back a little bit here. So it does look like the market does kind of peak in maybe Q1, early Q2 of 2024, and then just kind of, uh, so so kind of the, the he, sell in May kind of gets pulled forward a little bit. Is that fair? Um, it Maybe not pulled forward, but it, it pauses. It starts to pause. And I, I think a lot of that has to do uh, maybe a little bit earlier in the election year. I think a lot of us do with the actual campaign cycle. Although that, that's shifting, you know, everyone's jockeying for being the first state to have their primary or a caucus or whatever but um it's basically when the campaigning starts to, to heat up the mud starts to get slung or slinged um and you know you start to get an idea of how the you know incumbent president or party is going to be um you know what their chances are by the way the market is reacting to it. because when you have a, a a change of of leadership a change of party or a change of individual you know um it, it creates uncertainty um so you know it can peak a little bit earlier especially if there is trouble with the existing uh campaign the existing the sitting president or the or the party in power and then you can you know uh reverse engineer that that handicapping to forecast what the market's going to do so you know if the beginning of the election year is not great I means the president's probably you know, having some trouble with his campaign or with, you know, popularity, which will also make the market more um, uh, sensitive to things, more, to uncertainty, and it might not be the greatest election year out there. I don't see that happening right now, but, you know, we, we're, we're open to, to observation. So, yeah. um, I mean, I... <laughs> Yes, a great question, but I was I was rolling up to just to zoom in on on the the pre election. Right, right. We, well, we can get to the presidential stuff in a second. But yeah, so... I got a chart for you on the president on, on the on the power of sitting presidents. But this is the you know we 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 hit the end of that pretty much the end of the the week period. Though you know today's trading action and the news flow and the ten year which we spoke about and we can get into. Or make me a little bit curious, a, a little bit concerned that we can get that late October, you know, secondary low. Um, you know, that late October is really the best time to buy stocks. We, we, you know, we we have issued, you know, some uh, a, a, a buy recommendation to our newsletter subscribers, um, but uh, we haven't put out, you know, a full new basket of stocks, which we're going to be waiting for probably in a couple of weeks, which is really where the um, the alpha comes from. But uh, I, see, I see. So, so we we should still be anticipating some seasonal strength into the end of the year, November, December, kind of starting a little later than it usually does in October. Um, not necessarily. Uh, you know, it, it, October is that turnaround month. That that you know that bear killer, the bargain month. Uh, it could very well have been the first couple of days. I mean, this this is this is twenty three right here in the purple line. I know it's a little bit faded with the yellow box here, but. This low still could hold. I mean, today it's off a bit. It's not. It's not back down here yet. Um, you know, this is the election year pattern of the blue line, very typical. Uh, but this is an average. It doesn't mean we always get the low right here at the last week of the year, but the last week of October, excuse me. Um, this is our aggregate cycle. You know, all years, uh, all pre-election years, and all years ending at three, um, and then all years at the bottom. But uh, you know, it, it's it's this is when you got to become a trader. You know, yeah. When so making... so, so yeah. let me ask you: Are there any specific areas of the market that you want to be in during that you know final stretch of the year that that seasonal tailwind there? Because I, I I think I saw that so, small caps tend to have pretty good seasonality at the end of the year. Small caps in tech, um, but I'll get to that in a second. Most of our our sectors hit their bullish uh um seasonal period the beginning of it in october you know okay th things like you know utilities you you get out of but the, but the whole gamut of you know from consumer to to uh um to semiconductors to high tech to real estate i mean everything really starts to fire uh into the bullish period during um october uh but small caps 
small caps need all the help they can get. Um, I think there's, you know, there's a, there's a bigger picture on small caps. If we talk about in the almanac that when, you know, small caps do better during uncertain times, you can see that happen in, in the, in the COVID um, period where there was a big pop in the Russell uh, and other small caps. But when major bull markets get established, um, the small stocks don't uh, perform as, you know, outperform as much because, you know, the, the, the large caps are, are, are running the show there. Um, so that might be a more emblematic of a the secular bull market that's that's gathering some steam here. Um, I mean, we could dive into that. There's a couple of charts in the almanac on that, but seasonally here, short term, um, the end of October is where Russell 2000 small cap stocks start to outperform. Uh, there's something that used to be called, or that's still referred to as the January effect, not to be confused with our January barometer. Not necessarily a topic for this. This trend lines over headlines episode, but um, <laughs> I was going to say we're we're going to have to have you on again in in January because there's so many between December and January. There's so many important seasonal uh, indicators, right? You have the Santa Claus rally. You have, as you mentioned, for the January, five days right? the January barometer. What, what we call our January indicator trifecta. Which, right. There's right. A, new, a new page in the 24 Almanac that covers that. Um, well, so. So, and sorry to keep jumping around, but right. how did those uh, January and late December indicators, were they pretty prescient this year? Did they um, hold That's up? That's what and- got us bullish, um, very bullish uh, early on. You know, that was what sent us towards our um, best case scenario for our annual forecast. We put an annual forecast every December just before the holidays, you know, last, uh, last Thursday before Christmas. But once we got the trifecta this year, which was the reverse of last year. If you remember why we got bearish earlier in 22 was because we didn't hit that January indicator trifecta. It was confirming with the pre-election year, you know, overlay of, of the bullishness of the third year of the presidential cycle, um, a bear market bottom in October of 22. Here, I'll show you just a quick, this is one of the things I put on this uh, S&P chart is this green line is pre-election years after midterm year bear markets, which now everyone's Ooh. saying we had one. But if you remember last year, nobody was really, you know, it was few of us that were um, willing to admit that we were in a bear market and that we had seen the bear market bottom at the turn in October. Very few right. people came out with that. And now everyone's saying, oh, this is how much we're up since the bear market low of 22, of October 22. Well, <laughs> a lot of good that does a year later. But um Nothing changes sentiment like price, right? So, so how does how does that differ uh, than when the prior year is it's coming out of a bear market? Well, here's all pre-election years in the in the black line on this S and P chart. First term year presidents, and here's the aggregate cycle of everything. So, um, it's usually it's more bullish. I mean, it's, oh, wow. it's just you know it, it adds to it adds juice to the market if you're coming off a low in October like that. Um, and, go ahead. No, no, you go ahead. You got me jumping around a lot. We're talking about small stocks. Right. So the right. January effect um, used to be that small stocks outperform, outperform large caps in January. And then, you know, we do a, a little strategy where you buy, you know, stocks making new 52 week lows. Used to be December 15th beats the composite indexes, you know, through February 15th. That's shifted a little bit, but what we've seen is small caps doing have been their best outperformance in the last two weeks of December. So really, uh, before you know, you mentioned coming back on in January, which is great, but I want to make sure people realize that. Th- and if you look at at your, you said you have an O2 almanac on hand. I do, uh, I do. I left my 2023 okay. almanac at home. I so got I got the 24 my here. But if you could just, I don't have this chart here. You can see this. This low in October, late October low for small caps on there. And then really, really outperforms. Is that the relative strength? That's Russell 2000 over 1000. Oh, okay. And, um, you know, the easiest way to get a copy of this is subscribe to my service. Just to get so a free <laughs> so uh, if I hear you correctly, it's, it's kind of like the January effect has kind of gotten pulled forward a little bit. Is that correct? Okay, 100%. so those last yeah. two weeks of January, you want to be looking at potential small cap outperformance, and you, you know, can start looking now. 
Yeah. So just, right. just to, to, to go off on that a little bit, you know, when when we do our stock baskets around, you know, the beginning of the best six months, which we're in right now, um, you know, we do a robust fundamental screen overlay with technical analysis. And we're looking for stocks that are off Wall Street's radar that are, you know, uh, have an acceleration of growth and revenue and earnings, et cetera, so forth. Not followed by a lot of people, a, a lot of analysts. But um, last year, we did two baskets that were pretty effective. And the second one in November, I believe it was November one, we picked up Super Microcomputer, which was oh, about wow. eight. Yeah. It, it, you know, and it's one that's still on our list, but it ended up, you know, it was like 8193 or something when we put it out there. It it became the biggest holding in the Russell 2000 for a while. But yeah, I mean, that was an unbelievable chart. Yeah. And Excellus Technologies also. So we weren't really sure, you know, we don't claim to know why these things are doing very well. But when we run through the numbers, you know, all the 10Ks and 10Qs, you know, we use obviously software, but um, stock screening, uh, but we run it by hand in Excel so that we don't miss anything and we don't have any sort of, you know, random macro things, you know, doing something behind the scenes we can't see. But we're we're going to be looking at small caps and mid caps early um, you know, probably in the next couple of weeks and putting that basket out to subscribers and then follow up after earnings season um, with probably the large cap basket um, as we're seeing that 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 becoming an effective technique or effective tactic and strategy. I see. So so they tend small caps tend to start outperforming at towards the end of October. But those last two weeks are the really, really uh, bullish part. But it, it kind of starts now. And, you right. know, at, at, at the top of your slides, you had a really good point there. You said, always ask the question, if not. And I want to make that point because that's kind of how I think about seasonality, where we know what should happen. And based on that, we can kind of evaluate what's actually happening. And if it's going against seasonality, we know that there's probably something up. So there's still information when seasonality doesn't work. Is, is that fair to say? Yeah, there's a couple of quotes that come to mind. Um, first of all, this Talmudic Wisdom quote is from John Malone uh, quoting Moses Shapiro of Texas Instruments. Instruments. He says that, you know, he, Moses Shapiro told me once that uh, few people have, 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 plan, have plans for when their assumptions are wrong. Always ask the question, if not. Um, that's Talmudic Wisdom is the quote. Uh, so that's kind of wh why I go there. But the when seasonality is not working is another one from an old guy, Edson Gould, uh, I think it was findings and forecast was his service that, you know, if stocks don't rally during the bullish period, I'm just going to paraphrase this. Um, then, you know, there are other forces at play. And when, when that period's over, those forces will really have their say or something like that. I'm not sure he rhymed it so much, but no, yeah, yeah I'm familiar with that one. I'll yeah, throw the so, quote up too. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's in it's in one of the, it's in the almanac. It's it's in my database of quotes. So is the Talmudic wisdom one. But in fact, that's probably where I got it from. <laughs> arguably, <laughs> those are old Yale quotes. Those aren't ones that I that I can <laughs> that I that I that I procured or or um, curated. But um, to apply but this to today's market, so let's say we don't get this seasonal uh, period that people are anticipating or that usually happens, what would that tell you? Let's say the market either is flat or down between October and the end of the year. Well, I mean, it would start to tell me that, you know, there's, there's some other forces that are stronger than seasonality, um, could be, uh, interest rates, could be inflation, could be geopolitics, uh, could be, you know, internal U S politics. Um, could be something new that we don't know about right now, but uh, it would tell me that the, you know, market is not liking what it sees, you know, out in the future, six to 12, to, six to 12 months out. <laughs> right. So, it's, it's like that Edson Gould quote that you just mentioned, where if it's not rallying when it's supposed to, how do we think it's going to do when it, when seasonality <laughs> turns bearish again, right? Right. It, it, especially, you know, since we've been tracking seasonality so closely, as we discussed earlier, and the four-year cycle. So that would mean there's something, you know, trumping seasonality uh, and, and you know, behavior, you know, repetitive behavior of institutions and the collective market, which is what creates these patterns. I mean, it's, it's not just non-correlated. There's causation here. 
with what people do with their money on a regular basis and what, you know, f- large fund managers and institutions uh, are, are doing on, on a quarterly basis, on an annual basis, and on a macro basis. So um, if the macro becomes, you know, more of an issue, the, you know, quarterly and annual gets, gets you know, banged around a bit. Yeah. Now, I, I know you update these seasonal patterns every, you know, at the end of every period, whether that's the month or the year. Uh-huh. Have you observed any like notable shifts in seasonality over the years or more recent oh, yes. years? I mean, not so much recently because it takes a, a few years to, to see a shift, but um, right. I guess because you're looking at an average of. Right. I mean, we see a something. lot of fluctuations in the days of the week, which people like to ask about. And that seems to be a little more fickle with what the overall market trend is. So, you know, Fridays and Mondays are weak in bear markets. We're seeing people not wanting to, you know, hold uh, um, positions going into the weekend and nervous coming out. So you see the middle of the week has become stronger. Um, one thing that's consistent is the intraday patterns, which, uh, uh, you know, the more I the more I, I, I look at it, I think is impacted by the European close. Um, oh, okay. Uh, and what is well what is the intraday pattern typically look like? Um usually you have uh, um, weakness after the open and then, you know, as folks go to lunch and then that two two thirty period is the weakest part. So like, if you're looking to take a position and you don't have your, your price, your buy limit, just wait around till the mid afternoon <laughs> when everyone, when everyone gets a little tired and then yeah. that rally to the close. I mean, we've seen when we first came out with the, 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 the Thanksgiving trade that got, that got impacted and shifted. Uh, we've seen the the you know days of the month get get spread out. We saw um, it used to be just the last trading day of the month and the first four days of the month where the where all the action was. Then it became the super eight where there was that spike in the middle of the month that was created by the you know payroll deductions for four hundred one ks and IRAs and that kind of stuff going having to go into the market. So there's been some shifts. We're seeing the best eight months become more um, dominating with with Nasdaq and technology. Uh, uh, you know, having that sort of best eight months pattern and pushing things a little longer. So we sort of use that sell in May period that everyone's, everyone likes to talk about. So when we get our Dow and S&P, you know, seasonal sell signal sometime after April 1st, between when we get the NASDAQ sell sometimes after June 1st, we start shifting into a more cautious stance and, you know, tightening up stops, getting rid of losers, um, you know, that kind of thing. So, um, it's it's always shifting. That that's why uh, that's my job. I want to move on to Bitcoin seasonality. Uh, you, you teamed up with Crypto Burb, uh, Adrian. To do a report, yeah, Adrian. What is it? Zdunchek. Uh, Zdunchek. Right? Did I say that? Did I get it? I don't know. Did I get it right? I probably butchered it. So Adrian, no, I, I'm sorry. We, I practiced it with him on on, on our WhatsApp chat. <laughs> uh, he's a great he's, guy. So. He's a um, so what were the key takeaways from this? Um, well, I learned a lot. Um, and I had fun uh, with something new, putting a new asset class uh, through the Almanac, um, you know, paces through the Almanac uh, uh, scientific method of testing things. Um, I learned about the having cycle, the having uh, uh, four-year cycle, which... Is, I'll is, tell you that is some fascinating stuff. It, yeah, there's a chart that Adrian did, um, which was pretty cool, really cool. And I, you know, it's not, it, it, it's a, it's about four years, whereas the presidential four year cycle is exactly four years because we're the only country on the planet that has a regular election for its leader at the same time every four years. Uh, whereas the having, which it, I'll take a second, is Every 210,000 blocks on the chain, the mining fee is cut in half. Right. It's almost like a so, form of monetary policy written into Bitcoin's code. Yes, precisely. But it happens, you know, not on an exact time, on a date. So it's about four years-ish. The right. I think it's slated or expected for March of 2024. It's actually April now, the last I, oh. I looked in. And d- during the time when I, Adrian and I barked on this research from, say, you know, we, 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 we became friends and acquainted at the CMT in, in, um, 
uh, uh, April in New That's York right. City. We uh, met at um, Brian Shannon's book signing thing uh, uh, event, and um, you know, we came up to big C's an old fan, big fan of the Almanac, and and then we we started talking. You know, once the Almanac was was done, you know, I was in the process of putting the twenty four book together, and then so from like June through September when we you know started really working together and was it was a real collaboration by the way you know wordsmithing and working together and talking it it was it was cool I I I like Lennon and McCartney or Jagger and Richards (laughs) I like it I wish I wish but uh so yeah what what is what's the the best month to buy in what's the the... having thing wait a second the having thing shifted from like mid-April to late April so you said March. I think it's now like late April. So that's the whole I point. Where and the thing with with Bitcoin is, you know, one of the problems with doing seasonality on it is that there's no closing price. You know, you have to be able to know when it to, to know what it did on the, each day. What, where does the close? It trades twenty four seven three sixty five. Okay, so you take midnight. Where? Which time zone? New York, Greenwich. You know, me and Meridian, right. Polish time, where Adrian is. I mean, so. That's one of the, the 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 obstacles with doing that, but um, you know, we released this report in um, I don't know if you wanted to show a quick shot of it in uh, in September, late September, which is sort of the annual low, which you can see uh, on the. So you guys timed it perfectly, right? I'm sure. Yeah, that wasn't we wanted to have a little fun with it, and and it did actually happen. So here's here's my chart of of Bitcoin. Um, and, you know, in, in the paper, we also did the monthly seasonal pattern of September, um, you know, where that low was sort of September 26th, which kind of happened. It was actual low was a little bit earlier. But I mean, uh, hey, close enough, right? Pretty close. So the fact of the matter is, you know, the beginning days of Bitcoin were kind of crazy. Um, and I didn't even get into the whole four year cycle of the having of the having cycle, but we can. But for 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 this right here, you can see on this left axis, it goes up to two thousand percent because you know back in uh, the early days, um, it shot up like that with the whole you know there wasn't really a, a, a seasonal pattern as much back then. So we have data going back to July twenty ten, which is pretty much what everyone has. I um I, I felt like I needed to break out the the early years with the latter years to sort of see what's what's happened i mean there was a big event in in december i think it was december 2017 of memory serves that the cme started the futures trading for bitcoin so that okay. was in the beginning of acceptance from what they call trad i think it's right traditional but finance. that kind of marked the peak didn't it it marked the the the, the peak then i mean if you want to go back and look at the well, you, right the, right for that cycle yeah for that for that having cycle here is 2017 CME right here, right? I think I'm doing that correctly. Right. And there was a peak right there, correct, in your in your memory and, and judgment. And then, you know, it goes, that was mid, mid-having mid cycle. Then it, you know, traded down through uh, 19, rallied again. But the peak, the point of the, of the, 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 the having cycle is that so far it has never returned to the having levels and it seems to sort of have this like cup and handle into the having yeah so you're saying after the having cycle it kind of never retests that point where it was wow well, that is i mean three and oh point three and oh three just from the back of the napkin kind of analysis i've done on having you tend to almost always see a breakout to all time highs within three to six months of the happening. But the time of the happening, everyone always, you know, the media drums it up and everyone always anticipates this overnight move. And you don't usually get it a lot of the times it's sell the news, but it still does play out over those next three to six months. It's just not as apparent to people, you know? It, it has played out three times. We talked about seasonality, what happens when it doesn't work. <clears throat> a moment ago right i think this is a bit of a proving uh point um for for bitcoin and, and crypto the next having and you could say heavening or having i, I think <laughs> i think it's i used to say heavening but i think i mean it sounds like the the the, the reckoning or awakening or something right. like that so, i like that one better yeah 
well, I think there's I think they're shifting towards heavy, but as it becomes less profitable to mine Bitcoin and people have more of it, the the it becomes le- you know a little less valuable because it's it's like you know if you've got ten bucks uh, uh, and, and you have a thousand dollars to your name versus you know ten dollars and you got a million dollars to your name, that ten dollars move doesn't mean as much. So uh, um, there's there's something something going on there that we need to see if Bitcoin can continue to track this having cycle um, and and you know stay up there um, and the seasonal cycle, which is what we're looking at right here. Um, and if people want that report, they can reach out to me. I took yeah, it I was off. Going to ask where where can they find uh, that Bitcoin report? Um, there was a link on my website. That we'll make sure to include the link in the description for the video. So. I actually kind of took it down because it, um, but they can just contact us if, if they don't, I'm going to give it to you. Do I have a chat here. Where's my thing? I can send it to you later. Sounds good. Sounds good. Um, so yeah, what what is the best month to buy Bitcoin in? What's the best month to start taking profits on average throughout the year? I mean, the thing that we, t- I mean, it really tracks the stock market closely. It tracks the NASDAQ best eight months, potentially, you know, like a 4X move on it. Um, so you can see here, you know, you got these these best uh, eight months from like October to, to, to May or end, to May or June. September's the best month to buy. That was that's why we put the re- report out in September. Um, that's right. Remember, remember to buy in September. Adrian's posted that on Twitter recently a bunch, and it's almost like you know you just buy each September. You know, you you can trade it if you want and get out in the, you know the the May or or, or um, you know end of May end of April period, um, but it's really just buy in September. So it does more or less track the stock market. Uh, generally, you know, obviously it's a yeah. little more nuanced, but and that makes sense too, right? It's almost like this high beta risk asset. So if stocks are doing well, this should be five it's, times. It's like well. a tech stock. It's really like a tech stock and, and, and a you know a small a small cap tech stock. Yeah, and we certainly saw that last year. It seemed like the two were uh, Nasdaq and Bitcoin were trading just like that, right? Yeah, I mean, again, the time frame, you know, well, what, it's 12, 13 years of data we have, it's still a little bit limited to really see a pattern. And, and I and as I broke out of my chart here, you know, the first, what, seven, eight years are kind of questionable, you know, until there was some real institutional adoption um, that there wasn't really as, and, and when I first started researching this years ago, I had it on a chart with, um, you know, the dollar, the bond, the commodities, the gold, and the stocks. And there was, it wasn't correlating to anything um, at, at that time, like, you know, whatever year I was looking at, it, it might have been three or four years ago or, or something like that. But now it seems to be tracking, you know, U.S. equity patterns. Um, but again, you know, 18 to 22 is, you know, a little bit small of a data set for, you um, for a real seasonal right. pattern to exist. Now, this is one where when you update it at the end of the year, it probably will shift a little bit more, right, each year? I would think so, because you've got, you know, less less points to put in there. I mean, le- less points in the average already. So, you know, you've got 13 data points and you're at a 14th. It's going to be much different than if you got 75 data points <laughs> and you're hitting one. Yeah, and no, I'm glad you brought up the happening and that 2017 peak. I remember talking to a guy who does product at CM, CME Group, and he was saying there was a reason that Bitcoin peaked back in 2017 when the futures came out because it gave institutions a way to short. And if you remember that giant rise in 2017 at the end of the year, was um, that was kind of the public's first introduction to Bitcoin. Uh, you know, uh, tech, or tech people and some market people had heard of it, but nobody was taking it seriously until that initial rise from like 5,000 to 20,000 in a couple months. Uh, but then you had the futures come out that gave institutions a way to short. And that was it for that cycle. 
as you pointed out, we uh, that wasn't the ultimate high, right? No, it was um, definitely you know when it became when it grew up, you know when 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 institutions could short it. So, is there anything? And this is the last question, but uh, is there anything you mentioned? A few concerns, but any of any potential bullishness into the end of the year what could possibly derail it or what are you watching uh as potential well i mean the ten, the 10 year i mean we talked about the dollar you know being negative for, for the market but i think the 10 year drives the dollar um That's and a good i point. think and i and I, I i think some of the you know geopolitical uncertainty can you know <clears throat> have a little flight to safety into bonds um inflation uh you know we have an inflation chart that uh <laughs> we share with with our subscribers a lot uh, this cpi just came out it was higher than expected that's kind of probably what spooked yields um today, a, yeah yeah there's a exactly today there's a there's a um you know tough comparisons uh going forward the easy comparisons are, are over anything less than you know, month over month, 0.1%, as you can see in this chart, are um, is, is going to have the the uh, CPI 12 month change going higher um, short term, and then never being able to get to two uh, percent. Uh, you know, what, what was what was the month over month today? I don't know. It was like three or four or something. Point three or four or something like something that. Something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Point three and change. So, you know, here we are on, on, on the blue and sort of yellow line, um, track. I mean, uh, higher for longer, for sure. More hiking. I, I don't think so. Uh, well, not with what's going on in the world and, and, um, you know, the, the lag that we all know exists with, with tightening, but, um, yeah, the fed and interest rates, uh, are probably the biggest concerns and 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 that'll get impacted by inflation and oil prices and you know geopolitical and political uncertainty i like it well i don't like it but um thank you so it much for coming is. on it's always uh it's always a pleasure talking to you and for those of you listening at home definitely be sure this is the 2022 one but definitely be sure and go out there and get your Stock Traders Almanac for 2024. It's always on my Christmas list. Uh, I think I missed one year, but uh, is it? It's out yet, right? It's hit in the warehouse. I've got my, you know, uh, advanced authors copies, um, and but it's not really shipping to individuals. You can you can place pre orders on Amazon and stuff. But if you want it for free and you want to get it, you know, faster. Uh, take a subscription out to my service and it comes free with every subscription at stock. There you go. And there's a, and like the a subscriptions, says, the subscriptions a lot more than, um, you, you've given me access to your research and it's a lot more than just the, what, what's in the Albanac. You have, uh, the portfolio and everything like that. Yep. We, and, and, you know, the ETFs, we recommend the stocks, you know, it's not just here, buy this or sell this. It's like, buy now at this price use this buy limit this stop loss you know take a profit here uh so there's some pretty solid guidance in there and um a lot of stocks you're not going to get watching um most other other sources we, we look for stuff that's off the radar and i don't want to super micro computers <laughs> as, I, as i told you yeah <laughs> Man, that thing was just a beast, but we got to leave it here. But I hope you'll come back on in January to give us an update on all those uh, January and turn of the year indicators that, that are there. Surely. All right. Well, have a great weekend, Jeff. Thank you, Patrick. You'll be good. Thanks. Thank you guys for watching. If you enjoyed the show, be sure to click like and subscribe, and we'll see you again next week. Thanks.